Hello, I'm Laura Ercolino, and in, the, in this excerpt from one of our Hope's Garden Brides of Christ classes, our heart-led study of the Song of Songs, we're going to be looking at verses 3, 6 to 3, 11 of the Song of Songs. What is this coming up from the desert like a column of smoke, breathing of myrrh and frankincense, and every perfume the merchant knows? See, it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are 60 champions, the flower of the warriors of Israel. All of them skilled swordsmen, veterans of battle. Each man has his sword at his side against alarms by night. King Solomon has made himself a throne of wood from Lebanon the post he has made of silver, the canopy of gold, the seat of purple. The back is inlaid with ebony. Daughters of Zion, come and see King Solomon wearing the diadem with which his mother crowned him on his wedding day, the day of his heart's joy. As I was reading this, um, these verses again and again in the song preparing for this week, I just kept um, thinking, you know, Jesus is the flower of Israel. He is the champion of all the warriors. He is the one who has trained these skilled swordsmen that have their swords ready for the alarms of night. He's the ruler of this this army. And we're going to talk a little bit, a, a lot of today's, um, the theme that we're going to talk about is this. We have King Solomon, who is Jesus, who is the bridegroom. Now this is, you know, Old Testament again. So they're using Solomon. Um, not that it was literally Solomon. The Song of Songs was actually written after Solomon had passed. Um, but part of the theme running throughout the Song of Songs is a remembering of the glory days of King Solomon and really saying that when the bridegroom of Yahweh comes, those days will be even better, <laughs> even more glorious than the days of the glorious and mighty King Solomon. So in the scriptures, when it talks about King Solomon going into battle, it says he has 30 warriors surrounding him. But the new Solomon the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings has 60 warriors surrounding him. And one of the things when we talk about numbers in biblical numbers, um, I read in, I, I think it might've been Gregory of Nyssa, that when in the song, when we're gonna see this in a week or two, when it talks about the thousand bucklers hung around the neck of the bride, that it doesn't literally mean a thousand. The number thousand was just meant to indicate like, a huge number, a number beyond imagining. <laughs> okay. So, and that's the same way when it talks about that there's 60 warriors, it just means this, what it uh, would alert those who knew the scriptures to is that this King Solomon is even mightier than the King Solomon who had come before. It wasn't the literal number 60. So I want to read, um, I think it's important that we hear from, um, this is the selection from Theodore of S Cyrus about the name Solomon and why are we calling the bridegroom Solomon? Um, and I think that's important before we get into this imagery of the warriors and the champions. Who is this Solomon? To begin with, one must ask why they call the bridegroom Solomon. Solomon means peaceful. One can find this in Chronicles. For God said to David when he wanted to build a temple, Behold, a son shall be born to you. He shall be a man of peace. I will give him peace from all his enemies round about. For his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son and I will be his father. 
and I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. Now it is well known that Solomon died after he had lived a relatively short time and that his dynasty had an end. For that reason, our own peaceful Lord is called Solomon. Of him, the blessed Paul writes, for he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. And then from the cantata, Gregory of Nyssa again says, do you really believe that I want to talk about that Solomon born of Bathsheba? No, but of another Solomon signified by the first one. He too was born of the race of David, according to the flesh. His name is peace. He is the true king of Israel. He is the builder of God's temple. He is the one whose wisdom is unlimited, or rather, whose very being is wisdom and truth. He is the king of whom Isaiah had rightly prophesied that he would one day take the lead of his people to bring them back victoriously to their land. He who heralds peace, brings happiness, proclaims salvation, and tells Zion, your God is king. He is the genuine Solomon, the king of peace and glory. I just really love that statement from St. Paul. He is our peace. You know, thinking about the fact that peace for us is not some fleeting, intangible feeling, but peace is a person. <laughs> our peace is real and alive. He comes and he gives us. He told us, I give you peace, my peace. And I give it not as the world gives it. His peace is not the peace the world tries to convince us of what peace is. And his peace is not that peace. And he doesn't give it to us the way that the world gives it to us. He gives it to us freely, free gift for us. He wants us to know his peace. He wants us to be rooted and grounded in his peace. And his peace is his very self. And the peace and the calm that comes, like we talked about a few weeks ago, from knowing that I am my beloved's and he is mine. Of what or whom should I be afraid? I belong to him and he belongs to me. And he freely gives us this gift of peace. Now the challenge is <laughs> the world, the enemy, our own anxieties, our own confused thinking, our memories are always trying to steal that peace from us. And he gives it to us again and again saying, guard it protect it. This is my gift to you. Don't let anyone steal it from you. And so that's part of the challenge. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of that now about how do we protect this gift of his peace? And it seems that this is a real, very relevant, urgent challenge for us in today's world in particular. You know, I was just talking to someone on the phone a little bit ago who said she often thinks about like we talk about this monastery of our hearts that the Lord's calling us now to allow him to transform our hearts into little monasteries set apart for him and to keep his peace there, right? To keep that place consecrated, sacred, set apart from the world and all its troubles. And we were talking about, you know, um, Bernard and Gilbert of Hoyle and these monks that were reading and how in a sense it was it must have been so much easier for them back then living in these monasteries where, you know, the only form of communication with other people, like if, if Gilbert of, I mean, if, uh, William of St. Thierry wanted to communicate with Bernard, he'd have to write a letter and send it by horseback, you know, and it would take months then for him to get a letter back, you know, um, whereas today, like bombarded with information and noise and, and 
argument and conflict. And so guarding that peace is really, really important. Um, and how we do that and how he helps us to do that. I, I always think it's so important to always just keep remembering that we don't do any of this alone. We don't have to. We often do because we fall into that self-reliance and forgetting that we can do nothing without him and that he offers us grace and help to do everything that we need to do. And so always turning it all into a prayer. Um, give me the grace to protect your peace in me. Help me protect your peace. Um, Mother Mary, wrap your mantle around my heart and help hold his peace within me. Um, whatever, however it comes to your heart to pray and ask for that help. But I think sometimes um, we can, if we forget that we have all these helps, it can become overwhelming to think how, you know, even even the spiritual challenges we have growing in virtue, protecting his peace can sometimes become overwhelming. Well, how am I supposed to do that? Well, first remember, you don't have to do it. <laughs> you don't have to do it alone, at least. Um, <coughs> so the other, um, the other theme or image that really struck me was we're talking about Jesus being our peace and he is the Solomon that we are seeing rising triumphantly from the desert. And yet our king of peace is surrounded by battle imagery and warring imagery, right? So I asked him, what, okay, what's, what's going on here? What do we make of this? And there's a couple of things. One, um, one thing that came to me right away was St. John Paul II talked about that we have to accept, we have to realize and accept that the spiritual life is one of spiritual warfare, that we are in a battle. This is how it has been since the Garden of Eden, and this will, is how it will be until the end of this age, right? So we have to know that, to be aware of that, that there is an enemy of our souls, and he does everything he can to keep us from this intimate relationship with Jesus. That's what he wants to do, okay? So we have to accept that and realize that, keep that in our minds. And it also made me think of some things that Jesus told St. Faustina. He told her to fight like a knight. And he told her that she was on a stage, in a battle, on a stage, and all of heaven and hell were watching. And that's each one of us. That if we're going to truly be followers of Christ, if he belongs to us and we belong to him, we are in this battle. We need to fight like a knight. So it expanded the challenge even to me because then I thought, okay, so we know we're in this battle. We have this enemy of our souls and his minions, those demons and spirits who are constantly bombarding us and after us. And we have to fight that battle. And yet you're telling us be at peace all the time. <laughs> so this is a challenge. How do you stay at peace while you're warring, right? It's not be at peace and everything around you will stop and be calm. It's be at peace while this continues throughout your life. <laughs> while in every moment you're in a battle, still be at peace. Um, <coughs> sorry. So if we look at the lines about the um, the champions, around it are 60 champions, the flower of the warriors of Israel, all of them skilled swordsmen, veterans of battle. Each man has his sword at his side against alarms by night. So when I read that now, thinking about this guarding his peace in the midst of battle, I think about these swordsmen, these veterans of battle as the saints, the saints and angels that he has given us. They are already trained veterans in battle, right? The saints have already won their battle. They are free of this battle now, and he gives them to us. One, in the communion of saints spiritually, they are here with us, guarding us, helping us, protecting us. And two, we have their witness, their stories, their examples to turn to, to learn how to guard his peace while in the midst of this battle, because they did it and they did it successfully. 
So that was one, um, one interpretation of those lines that I, that I could see right away. And then also realizing that these images, um, the warriors, the swords, the alarms, that we also have to remember that our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with spirits and principalities. And so right away, Ephesians jumped into my mind. And what we are armed with, what these warriors are armed with, are these um, the, the sword of the spirit and these spiritual weapons that we have to fight this spiritual battle. That's really important for me, at least when I start to feel that peace being attacked and not having the strength to protect it, to remember that the battle's already been won. I just need to do my little part. I just need to protect his peace in me. I don't have to worry about the world falling apart around me. <laughs> just guard his peace in me. And if everybody just did their little part, fought their own little battle, it could change everything. It could change the, it would change the whole big battle, right? Um, if, if each of us as a warrior for Christ did just the battling he asked of us and not taking on what he doesn't ask of us. And remembering that he's already won. So when I thought also about the whole battle imagery and the spiritual battle, I thought about how um, so much of the battlefield is in our minds and in our hearts. You know, this is where the enemy attacks each one of us is in our own thoughts, um, through our emotions, through our memories. And so that just took me back again to the things that I have learned um, from just from recovering from trauma and therapy about how do we keep our focus on Christ? Because it's really in keeping our focus on him um, that then we protect that peace within us. And thinking about the fact that we, he has given us the power of a sound mind that we are empowered. We can't control every thought that pops into our minds, but we are empowered to choose which thoughts we engage with. We don't have to engage with every thought. And in fact, it's much better if we don't, we should not engage with every thought. Not every thought that pops into our mind is of God or from God or something that we should entertain. But taking that a step, a step further, and thinking about um, the, this battlefield of our mind um, and these distracting thoughts, almost sometimes um, they seem like intrusive thoughts, these things that we don't know where, where they pop out of, you know, where did that come from, right? Um, and a lot of, they pop in uninvited. But what the, the good news is, is that every time that happens and we choose to say, no, that's not of God. That's not a thought I need to engage. It's another opportunity to choose Jesus and to refocus on him. And so our brains were designed to think. And so they're, they're always going to be thinking. And if we're not filling them with thoughts of God, or thoughts of, you know, thoughts that he wants them to be filled with thoughts that relate to fulfilling our daily vocation, um, to growing spiritually, then the enemy is going to come in or our own voices are going to come in and fill them because our brains, we all know how hard it is. Even when we want them to be still and quiet, <laughs> we can't get them to be still and quiet. They really weren't designed to be still and quiet. <laughs> They're designed to think. And so they do. And so this learning that it's okay that these thoughts pop into my head. I don't have to beat myself up because um, even St. John of the Cross talks about not beating ourselves up when even like an impure thought pops into our head. You know, as long as we don't then con consciously dwell and ruminate and fantasize, it's okay. That's just the way our human brains work. And it's an opportunity to say, no, I'm not gonna go down that path and turn back to Jesus again. And that 
the thoughts themselves, the being distracted itself, there's no sin in that. The sin comes when we either one, entertain those thoughts and take them to places we shouldn't go, or we start self-deprecating and, and criticizing ourselves and what's wrong with me, but I shouldn't, you know, that we have these thoughts. He doesn't want us doing that either. He wants us to know this is human nature. It's okay. Just turn back to me again. Just turn back to me. Just return again. Begin again. It's okay. The other thing that all of this, of course, um, brought to my mind is Mary. Mary as mighty virgin warrior and crusher of the serpent's head. And that of all of the skilled swordsmen and veterans of battle who are on our side, we have our mighty mother <laughs> who wants nothing more <laughs> than to protect her children and help us to win this battle and make it to heaven with her and Jesus. I was going through the divorce and I had to, um, in a sense, well, I was definitely battling. Um, and I had to do a lot of battling to protect my children. And the, the one day we were driving back down to court again to file another motion. And she made a comment about me being such a warrior and a fighter. And I just started sobbing. And I said, I never want it to be a warrior and a fighter. She said, I know you don't, but she said, I don't see you as a warrior who's running into battle all enraged and like, you know, just wanting to fight. She said, you want to protect. She said, you're being like the mama bear who's battling because it's necessary to protect your children. And so that's how I see Mary, not running into battle because, oh, I want to fight and wield my sword, and but because I will do whatever it takes to protect my children. So a kind of a different kind of warrior than we see in war movies, right? <laughs> that mother warrior, the mother warrior who when our children are threatened, we can lift a car because we will do whatever it takes to protect, not not wanting and desiring fighting, but wanting the safety of our children. And if that requires me to fight someone to protect them, then I'll do whatever it takes. So actually in this next section, we are gonna talk even more about Mary. So let's move in to verse 39 and 310. King Solomon has made himself a throne of wood from Lebanon, the post he has made of silver, the canopy of gold, the seat of purple. The back is inlaid with ebony. To go with the verse, King Solomon has made himself a throne of wood from Lebanon, and the wood being the manger. And so I'd like to do a, like a little, just have you sit and close your eyes and just kind of do another little visualization. Um, this really comes from when I was writing the seven joys of the bride and the bridegroom rosary. Uh, and that's going to be um, one of our Advent uh, meditations at Hope's Garden. So we have a little booklet coming out with that. And I wanted to give you a little um, visualization of some of the other verses from the song and how they relate to this idea of Mary and Jesus, the bride and bridegroom. So just take a moment and envision the infant bridegroom in Mary's womb, this bed of Solomon that we just read about, where the word of God confined himself and inseparably joined to himself in unity of person, a human nature formed of her flesh. Now think of the moment, imagine Mary, you're with Mary and Joseph in that moment when she realizes it's time. It's time for the baby to be born. And hear her singing. I hear my beloved, see how he comes, leaping on the mountains, bounding over the hills. There was nothing our God would not do to come to us. He humbled himself, 
to be confined in her womb and take on our flesh and now to be born. See the infant God just moments after he enters our fallen world, clothed in sacred humanity. And as Mary lifts him onto her chest and holds him, and breathes in that scent of a newborn, she sings, My beloved is a sachet of myrrh lying between my breasts. If you've smelled an infant, can you imagine how the infant bridegroom, the scent of the infant bridegroom, myrrh and frankincense and all the perfumes the perfumer knows. And as St. Joseph and Mary wrap him in swaddling clothes, and she lays him in a manger. She looks up at Joseph and sings, See? King Solomon has made himself a throne of wood from Lebanon. King Solomon, our Prince of Peace, Jesus, the Bridegroom, made himself a throne. As Lord of all creation, no one gives him this throne. No one creates it for him. He has made it for himself. our sweet and humble king, shepherd, and bridegroom, willingly left the throne of glory that he had prepared for himself in the heavens and came down taking on our humanity to lie in a manger, his throne of wood from Lebanon. And then Mary invites us to come and see him 33 years later. You can think of the moment of incarnation as his first wedding day, where his divinity was wed to our humanity. And now 33 years later, she says, daughters of Zion, come and see King Solomon wearing the diadem with which his mother crowned him on his wedding day, on the day of his heart's joy. So first we can visualize the crucifixion scene, the crowning of thorns. His wedding crown was in Jewish tradition that the bridegroom would wear a crown on his wedding day. And so Jesus's mother did not get to see him wed in a glorious wedding crown, but with a crown of thorns. We can think of the cross as the marriage bed of the bridegroom. And actually, as I was thinking about all this, I thought of the icon that Deborah had told me she had gotten at Gethsemane, where Mary and Mary Magdalene and St. John are gazing upon Jesus on the cross and smiling. As they can see beyond the cross. They can see the spiritual reality that exists on that cross that others could not see. That this was the day of his heart's joy because he was wedding himself to all of us because he was purchasing our redemption and opening the gates of heaven so he could be one with us because he knew and that the resurrection was coming, that he was overcoming death and sin for us, that he was betrothing us beneath the apple tree of the cross, beneath the apple tree where Adam and Eve had been corrupted, that he was righting what had been wronged. So we have two moments of bride, the bridegroom being wedded, his wedding days, the day of his heart's joy, two moments in time in his humanity. His humanity is in time, right? 
So we have the moment of the incarnation and we have the moment of the crucifixion. And then we have his wedding days that are outside of time that continue on and on throughout all of time when souls recognize him as the bridegroom of Yahweh, when they willingly enter into the covenant relationship that God invites them to. What joy there is in the harps of Jesus and Mary when his promised brides accept the invitation to become his bride. And each one of those is a wedding day when Mary gets to see him crowned with the glorious wedding crown. And so I think about as we each here at Hope's Garden, as we're um, having these consecration ceremonies, what joy, what joy and consolation that must bring to the sorrowful hearts of Mary and Jesus to have souls consecrating themselves to the bridegroom. And I think this is an important thing to leave you with and for us to remember as we think about our own, um, you know, it's part of that eternal now, I think, that we don't just enter into this covenant relationship, into this enthroning Christ as king and spouse of our hearts once and done. It's a continual everyday renewal of covenant, right? Renewal of that promise. Um, and so one um, place, one idea that I want to give to you to, to take with you from this week, to take into your own prayer and meditation, is that it is the, the risen bridegroom that we are wedded to. The moment in time of his being the suffering and dying bridegroom is over and done. He didn't stay on that cross. He is risen. And he invites us to be brides of the risen bridegroom, to hold on to that hope of our resurrection, that hope of the eternal wedding feast, where we will not suffer anymore, where we will not have to fight the battle, where it will not be a struggle to maintain his peace within us. We will exist completely in that peace. And so this is Rupert of Dietz again. And, um, he is talking about um, the wedding day of King Solomon, the wedding day of the bridegroom. She crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day on which he came forth from my womb as a bridegroom from his chamber, and on the day of his heart's gladness, the day on which crowned with a crown of thorns, he brought his work to completion and rejoiced in the triumph of his resurrection, which was to follow. And so the story never ends at the cross, not for any of us, if we belong to Jesus. We are promised a resurrection. And this is who comes to us now, asking us to espouse our souls to him. The risen bridegroom, no longer crowned with the crown of thorns, but crowned with his crown of glory.